The John Innes Centre is home to a collection of rare books and archives that represents an important resource covering natural science, horticulture and botanical art across 500 years. The earliest book in the collection dates from 1511 and the earliest archives from the 18th century. Outreach curator Sarah Wilmot has chosen some images from these important collections to tell the story of new foods in England. If we go back far enough, we'll find that many of our familiar kitchen garden plants were once unfamiliar foods. While many plant introductions entered the country inconspicuously, brought in over the centuries by sailors and new settlers, there was a move to deliberate plant hunting for food from the 15th century. Initially, the most obvious exchange of exotic food plants was driven by the trade in spices. At first, the Europeans who bought from Arab traders were just buyers and consumers of spices, wouldn't necessarily have seen the plants from which they were made. Sugarcane and sugar-making techniques were known to Europeans from contact with Muslim Arabs in the Holy Land. The knowledge had spread there from India and Persia. From there, sugar-making was introduced to Cyprus and Greece. From the 15th century, European powers looked for new sources of spices and sugar to bypass existing merchants. New worlds were discovered, and countries in Africa, Asia and the Americas were colonised. The colonists began to collect new food plants, transporting them around the globe. This huge expansion in international trade made some people very wealthy, but was driven by the slave trade. The first slaves to be brought from Africa to work in a sugar plantation were shipped to Madeira by the Portuguese in 1444. By the time the first printed herbals became available in England in the 16th century, English herbalists like John Gerard knew and recorded that sugarcane was grown in some places with slave labour. A new plantocracy with wealth built on plantations was beginning to grow. One of the new tropical foods to arrive in England was the pineapple. John Parkinson named the pineapple in 1640 because of the form resembling a pine cone. But he also describes it as the fruit of a kind of thistle. He described the flavour as tasting like as if wine, rose water and sugar were mixed together. Though it's unlikely he'd ever tasted one. Though it tasted pleasant, he warned, Surfeit is dangerous. The pineapple had not yet been introduced into England, though it had been known in parts of Europe for 150 years. By Parkinson's day, pineapples were associated with the East and West Indies, where it grew plentifully. But the pineapple had been originally shipped there from Brazil, a good example of the effects of European colonisation and plant exchange. When the pineapple was introduced into England, it was associated with kingship. The picture is the King's gardener John Rose presenting the first pineapple to Charles II. The pineapple's rarity meant it attracted the interest of the aristocracy. This interest is reflected in pineapple follies and garden ornaments which you find in many grand gardens. The picture is the folly at Dunmore, Stirlingshire. In Norfolk, at Shropham Hall, the walled garden has a set of pineapples on plinths and there's also a Georgian pineapple obelisk in Holt. The pineapple was also celebrated in expensive botanical books painted by the great plant painters, including George Eret and Pierre Joseph Redoute. Pineapples could be rented, displayed to wealthy friends. It was too valuable to eat, a single fruit would cost thousands of pounds. By Georgian times, skilful gardeners could grow pineapples in the hot houses of the aristocracy, but it still took years and was very costly in fuel and labour the pineapple was still a food for the very rich. The pineapple's celebrity status ended when steamships started to import pineapples regularly from the colonies. By the end of the 19th century, the middle classes and the working classes could buy pineapples cheaply from market stalls. It's the changes brought to our staple starchy foods that have had the most impact on the English diet. An early introduction to Europe was maize, Maize was brought to Europe at the end of the 15th century and its cultivation in northern European regions has been reported since 1539. In Germany, the German herbalist Bock wrote it was in all gardens almost everywhere. Maize was also already well established in alpine regions of Italy by 1570, so we know maize adapted to lower temperatures was available by this time. <laughs> 
Maize became popular during the 17th century in northern Spain and southwestern France. This frontispiece from John Gerard's Herbal, 1597, shows maize as an exotic arrival to England, alongside new ornamental plants imported from Turkey in the Near East. Maize arrived before the potato, and at this time was known as Indian wheat, or Turkey wheat. Gerard's depiction of maize suggests it was familiar to botanists for decades, but it has only become a significant crop in England relatively recently. In the 19th century, imported maize flour was recommended to the poor when harvest failed. In 1846, English Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel arranged for £100,000 worth of maize flour to be bought to provide a substitute for the Irish potato crop, which failed spectacularly. Only when their stocks of potatoes had been exhausted would the Irish make use of what was still a strange foreign food. The cornmeal was nicknamed Yellow Dust or Peel's Brimstone. The months when they had to subsist on maize were dubbed meal months. Sweet corn was still an unfamiliar food in England at the start of the 20th century. The John Innes started breeding sweet corn in 1936. The aim was to produce a variety better adapted to the English climate. The John Innes trials involved establishing the best methods for growing and storing the crop, as well as finding the best varieties for English conditions. Many of the varieties then available were totally unsuited to English weather. Sweet corn hybrids and varieties were sourced from the US and some native maize strains from Peru, over 80 in all. From a series of trials, two F1 hybrid varieties of sweet corn were developed, John Ennis 1 and 2. They produced early and high quality cobs. Earliness is particularly important for success with sweet corn in the English climate and these hybrids could be relied on to produce ears in most regions. By the mid-1960s, John Innes II, known as Canada Cross, had become popular and was one of the main varieties grown in England, the seed selling at twice the price of other varieties. Maize has only become a significant crop in England since the 1970s. In 1973, there were about 20,000 acres grown. Latest figures suggest we're now growing in the region of 450,000 acres. Sweet corn sales increasing thanks to barbecues and interest in foods from the US and South America. The potato remains a staple of our diet 400 years after it was introduced from South America. The Spanish conquistadors, who first encountered the potato in South America, immediately recognised its value as a food for the slaves working in Spanish-run mines. At this time, it was essentially a food of the natives of Chile and Peru. But later, the Spanish settlers adopted the potato as a new food and took it back to Spain with them. The potato was cultivated in England by John Gerard in the 16th century. In his herbal, the spud gets a whole chapter to itself. But he also made a mistake. He gave its origin as Virginia in North America, rather than Chile and Peru in South America. The link to Virginia and the island of Roanoke led people to attribute the discovery to Sir Walter Raleigh or Sir Francis Drake. Walter Riley planned and financed the Virginia settlement, but never set foot there. Sir Francis Drake called there to pick up settlers and return them to Plymouth. Riley's agent Thomas Harriet, who did go to Roanoke and wrote an account of its commodities, probably gave Gerard the idea that potato tubers were found growing there. But the tubers described by Harriet, cultivated in Roanoke, were from a different edible plant species, the most favoured by settlers being the Jerusalem artichoke. Perhaps Gerard's confusion began there. The myth of Sir Francis Drake and the potato became widespread in Europe. In Offenburg, in Germany, for example, Drake was commemorated for bringing this gift from God in a statue which showed him standing on a plinth decorated with a frieze of potato tubers. This 19th century statue was destroyed by the Nazis. But neither Drake nor Riley were in the right place at the right time to have been able to bring the potato to England. It's just a legend. There is probably some truth that Riley introduced potato cultivation on his Irish estates and this helped popularise it there in the 1600s. When potatoes first arrived, they were compared with sweet potatoes. The sweet potato of Spain was introduced into Europe from the West Indies by Columbus in the late 15th century, where it was already widely grown. By the 16th century, when the first English herbal appears in print, sweet potatoes were already a familiar food in England but available only to the very rich. In 
In Shakespeare's time, we see that potato, like the sweet potato, was associated with lechery, and it was rarely left out of a recipe to excite Venus. It's not until the middle of the 17th century that the common potato begins to take its place as part of the household diet in some of the great houses of the rich. Early English herbalists recognised it as a very nourishing food. But there were also many people who viewed the potato with suspicion. The potato was the first edible plant to be grown from tubers rather than seed, and until then no similar plant was grown which bore numerous flesh-coloured nodules on underground stems. The cultivation and habits of the plant were both unusual. A rumour had started in France that eating the potato caused leprosy. Perhaps the irregular tubers of early potatoes suggested deformed hands and feet of lepers. By the end of the 18th century, the majority of English cottagers were now growing potatoes in the gardens, and it was grown widely as a farm crop. In Norfolk, Thomas Cook spent five years experimenting with potato, persuading his tenants to make use of it. But the only response he said he got was, perhaps wouldn't poison pigs. His cottagers were more interested. Cook allowed them to grow potatoes in his new plantations in 1795. Suffolk held out and resisted change. The potato's reputation in England suffered from its association with the Catholic Irish. An English election slogan at Lewis in Sussex in 1765, for example, read, No potatoes, no popery. It was also associated with poverty. Given a choice, for a long time the English working family would prefer to eat wheat bread over any other starchy food. When wheat harvest failed, the government tried to get the poor to eat substitutes. These included imported maize flour, imported Carolina rice, which incidentally was grown by slaves, but the more lasting substitute on offer was the potato. In the last five years of the 18th century, they were a common ingredient in workhouse diets and were often used in schemes of poor relief. It wasn't uncommon by the early 19th century for labourers to be paid partly in kind, with some potato ground as part of their wages. Was this, as some thought, a form of exploitation? The dependence of the 19th century poor on potatoes meant that when potato blight devastated the crop in 1845 and 1846, Ireland and parts of England experienced famine and hardship. Not many of the existing varieties had any resistance to blight, and fewer still had any lasting resistance to this and other potato diseases. Potato blight gave a stimulus to plant breeding, beginning the effort to produce blight-resistant potatoes. In the early 20th century, this led to a new interest in collecting wild potatoes from the Andes. Who were the plant hunters? If you're thinking of a European explorer sent out by one of the big European botanic gardens to find exotic plants, you have one important part of the story. It's certainly the kind of plant hunting that brought the pineapple back to Europe. But European collectors also worked with local people to identify samples and find material to bring back. Plant hunting was a dangerous business. Dangers include accidents, disease and hostile encounters with local people without even mentioning that some were captured by pirates and others, suspected being spies, were thrown in jail. In the 20th century, plant hunting became more organised, informing the new science of genetics. Nikolai Vavilov, a Russian collector, is thought of as the founding father of modern plant collections. In the early 20th century, Vavilov organised Russian expeditions from St Petersburg, sending collectors all over the world to search for new varieties of food plants for breeding. He identified eight primary centres of crop origin. Behind the first potato expeditions was the realisation that the biodiversity of European potato varieties was very small and restricted. Genetic variation was limited because modern varieties originated from the few novel importations of potatoes into Europe in the 16th century. It was only after Russian botanists Bukasov and Josepchuk returned to Russia from Mexico, Guatemala and Colombia in the 1920s with a huge collection of potato cultivars and wild species that the true vastness of the gene pool available around the world became apparent. This inspired other countries to plan their own collections. When it became difficult to access collections in the USSR, Britain and Commonwealth countries formed their own potato collecting expeditions. 
This is an example of one of the many plant hunting expeditions inspired by Vavilov's example. The seeds, plants and 1,164 potato samples were shipped back to England. A slow, more dangerous journey now that enemy ships were patrolling the oceans. The collection, the nucleus of what was later known as the Commonwealth Potato Collection, was temporarily established at Huntington Road, Cambridge. Due to the war, Cambridge became its more permanent location until it was moved to the John Innes Horticultural Institution in Hertfordshire in the 1950s and then on to the Scottish Plant Breeding Station in 1965. The collection's permanent home today is in Scotland. The John Innes Centre is no longer the custodian of the Commonwealth Potato Collection, but it does preserve the UK's key collections of cereals and peas. Today we call these collections genetic resources, or germplasm resources. Awareness has grown of the need to preserve biodiversity, and germplasm from around the world is needed to breed future crops with resilience to climate change and disease.